Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast. Episode number 82, Rosanna Cavallaro, Rape Shield Evidence and the Hierarchy of Impeachment. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Rosanna Cavallaro. Rosanna is professor of law at Suffolk University, where her teaching and scholarship are in the areas of criminal law, evidence, professional responsibility, and law and literature. Our podcast today features Rosanna's new article, Rape Shield Evidence and the Hierarchy of Impeachment, which was published in the American Criminal Law Review. In it, Rosanna examines the constitutional exceptions to Rule 412, the Rape Shield Law. Because Rule 412 was designed to be highly protective of victims, it can sometimes impede defendants from presenting an effective defense. Rule 412 has a carve-out for constitutional requirements, but thus far the Supreme Court has only found one carve-out for witness bias in the well-known case of Olden v. Kentucky. As Rosanna argues, this state of affairs means that defendants seeking to use rape shield type evidence for other purposes, like impeachment by contradiction or character for untruthfulness, those defendants are simply out of luck. This is what she means by the hierarchy of impeachment. Rosanna argues that this category-based hierarchy is wrong, and that the right to present a defense demands a more flexible case-by-case approach. Rosanna, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Your paper focuses on the structure and the exceptions to Rule 412, the Rape Shield Law, Just for a quick review, tell us a little bit about what the Rape Shield Law is, what's interesting about its structure, and perhaps most importantly, why it's there in the first place. Well, so the rule is designed to remedy what had been a practice in sexual assault trials, which was to have a defendant offer evidence of the victim or the complainant's prior sexual conduct to invite the inference that usually she, obviously I'm going to use she just for simplicity, but that the complainant consented because essentially they're the kind of person who readily consents or they are, other choice words, promiscuous of easy virtue, those kinds of ideas. And that inference had been available for many, many years, making it extremely difficult to try these cases. So the rape shield rule was designed to remedy that, to preclude evidence of other sexual conduct by a complaining witness. And what's curious about the rule is it it isn't structured like other sort of specialized rules of exclusion that define the prohibited inference and then say, well, any other use is okay. Instead, it's sort of the inverse. It explicitly enumerates the permitted uses of other sexual conduct and says that any other use other than those specifically defined permitted uses is barred. So it's much more difficult to offer that material than it would be, for example, evidence of subsequent remedies or evidence of character, other acts. So that is structurally where you begin, is that there are these two very narrow permitted uses of other sexual conduct. And then there's a catch-all, which is really superfluous because it's constitutional. It says if the Constitution requires it, obviously, then also you can use it. So that tees up the question, well, when is that? When is it that other sexual conduct evidence is of constitutional significance. And there are a number of theories on which you could imagine that other sexual conduct would be probative, would be useful to impeach the complainant or to prove other elements of the case. For example, mental state of the accused where that's at issue in a sexual assault. And so the question is, which of those enjoys this kind of constitutional status such that it could slip in under that catch-all exception. Structurally, that would be the exception. So the basic problem is that on the one hand, you want this very protective rule, but because you've structured it as 
I think what George Fisher describes as a German rule, so it's everything is prohibited unless ex expressly permitted, you have to make sure that you have enough safety valves for defendants to get in the evidence that they want. And you describe in your article that in order to get one of these exceptions, outside the two that are statutorily defined, the Supreme Court basically has to rule on them, and the Supreme Court has only established one safety valve, which is for bias-type evidence. Tell us a little bit more about that line of cases. That's exactly right. And so it's picking up on a line of cases that say that bias is special, bias is different, and it is an essential aspect of the defendant's right to put on a case. Before the world of rape shield, they talked about the idea of bias as different than the U.S. versus Able case is a case that we usually use to, to highlight that point, that you could have a couple of different theories of why material is impeaching. But only if the theory is bias will it enjoy this special constitutional status. And they talk about it in a somewhat vague terms, and they're not entirely satisfying in their explanation of why bias is different from, for example, character for untruthfulness or contradiction. But they root it in these sort of vague ideas of the defendant's right to present evidence, which has variously been located in the confrontation right, the due process right, the right of compulsory process. And what they've said is, well, bias is special and different and so can never be foreclosed by some other statute that has some important government interest. Where they talk about it in the world of sexual assault is in Olden versus Kentucky. So they take this line of cases already established that says bias is different from the language they use as sort of generalized attacks on credibility. Those are important, but they're not constitutional. They take that line of cases and they import it into the world of rape shield when the question is presented to them in Olden versus Kentucky. And there, as you might recall, we have a story of a complainant who is seen by her boyfriend getting out of a car driven by another man. And so the question is, should we be allowed to tell the jury that she's in a sexual relationship with the boyfriend and that the theory of impeachment is, well, she doesn't want him to think that she was, you know, cheating on him, basically. And so that's why she might have manufactured a story of an assault where there was perhaps instead a consensual encounter. And the court says, you have to allow the defendant to explore that because bias is special and different. And it has this constitutional quality that so can never be foreclosed. And then that decision ties into the language that I mentioned, which is where the Constitution requires it, you have to allow it. And so the upshot is that you can impeach on bias, and that would be consistent with Rule 412's prohibitions. That would be a route around the broad prohibition. Now, if I recall correctly, the Supreme Court, I don't think, has ever declined to extend it in these other impeachment modes. Is that right? Well, I think that I mean, we don't have the Supreme Court saying we refuse to do that, but we do have, and I'm trying to think of what case would nail it most clearly, but we do have courts at the appellate level not the Supreme Court saying, well, this is not bias. This is not quite enough. This is important, but it is not at the level of what we would recognize as a constitutional dimension of what the defendant is allowed to do at trial. And again, the language is very soft and vague. What we do see is that there are Supreme Court decisions that talk about how do you weigh a rule of exclusion against the defendant's right to put on evidence. And they talk in broad terms about we shouldn't have a per se approach. There should really be a weighing of the competing interests. And we need to think about what the interest is behind that rule of exclusion and set that against the defendant's interests, whatever they may be, compulsory process, right to due process, right of confrontation. And it doesn't quite align with other areas in which the court thinks about, well, What's the impact on the jury of not having this evidence in front of them? So one example that might help think this through is sort of the Brady area. In what instance would we say that failure to give over exculpatory material requires relief? And there we have the court talking about, well, how important is it? How much is enough? And they talk about whether it raises questions about the reliability of the verdict, whether it would have caused the jury a uh, you know, substantial likelihood that it would have caused the jury to reach a different result or reasonable probability that they would have reached a different result. But we don't see that 
kind of language when the Supreme Court or the courts of appeal are thinking about these other theories of impeachment. Instead, there's this sort of either or, either it's bias or it's not constitutional. And I I think that that's problematic and unsatisfying in terms of the discussion we've had so far. Why do you think that there's this preference for bias as opposed to the other kinds of impeachment? You know, that's a very curious question. I cannot find a satisfying rationale for it because I think we can imagine many, many variations in which there could be weak bias evidence. That is, the theory of impeachment is, oh, some relationship or some interest on the part of the witness being impeached, that if the jury knows that they're going to in some way discount the witness's credibility, right, that big category credibility. And we could also think of instances where there's really powerful contradiction, contradiction that would be more impactful to a jury in terms of the way they view a witness. And it's not really persuasive to me that the label under which the impeachment occurs is what tells us the force of the impeachment. So it's, that's really what I was struggling with in the paper is trying to get some satisfying sense of why those categories really determine the outcome rather than a more typical weighing or assessing with some quantitative tool how much, how probative, how significant, you know, words like that, that we really don't see in these discussions. So the way I read your argument, it's that the Supreme Court has essentially established a categorical way of looking at these kinds of impeachment. And if you're in the bias box, then you are likely to get an exception to the rape shield rule. If you are not in the bias box, you don't. Uh, And what you'd really like to see is a more nuanced case-by-case determination. So that leads to a question I had, which is, doesn't this then just boils down to the old-fashioned rules versus standards problem that, you know, we could have the hearsay rule, which we do, or we could not have the hearsay rule and on a case-by-case basis try to figure out whether the out-of-court statement happens to be reliable. Why is it different in this context that we really should focus on a case-by-case standard as opposed to a more categorical rule approach? Well, I think part of the problem is what you highlighted earlier, which is that structurally the rule is so contrary to the way we usually work in this area. That is the so-called German rule idea. And rules drafters, you know, they're good, but they're not perfect. And they just cannot ex ante anticipate every variation on the theme of what this trial would look like and anticipate and articulate precisely those contexts in which evidence ought to come in. So they took their best shot, they listed a couple, and they're just not enough. And as you said, there needs to be this kind of safety valve of the possibility that there's evidence out there that's deeply exculpatory, quite impactful in terms of how the jury is evaluating testimony. And the way the rule is structured, we just don't have that. And so the only other catch-all umbrella term that's available is this idea of when is it constitutionally necessary or required. And there, I think, we can pick up on what the court has said about Van Arsdale and, and those decisions that it should not be, per se, that it should be a weighing. So it's not so much about, I think, rules versus standards as a per se versus a weighing a case-by-case approach. And that, that weighing approach, I think, is, has much more prevalence generally when we look at these kinds of rules of exclusion, especially, you know, in a criminal setting where somebody's in jeopardy. So I'll be a bit of a contrarian. <laughs> Let me argue it the other way, which is in the rape shield context, one of the real concerns is with victims coming forward and victims requiring greater certainty in what they're likely to face at trial. And therefore, a more categorical approach would give that certainty or that definitiveness that we're looking for. Is there any merit to that position? Absolutely. I don't don't want to sound completely unsympathetic to the underpinnings of the rape shield rule. It's an important, necessary rule. And it did, I think, significantly affect the way these cases are tried. Although, interestingly, there is some research out there about has it really made a difference in terms of the number of prosecutions or all that kind of stuff, and I I can't speak to that. 
So I am sympathetic to the need for wh- what you described, not only a sort of predictability, certainty of a bright line rule, but the sort of sphere of privacy that some things ought to properly be off limits, that they're not part of the mix of the question of was this person assaulted? So again, what's the answer? I mean, we can't say that that trumps every other value. I mean, there's a defendant who's on trial for what's in most states a life felony. And to say that they're precluded from exploring whether a complainant lied in the past about whether another sexual encounter was consensual or an assault seems to me a little bit on the other far end. I mean, that might be much more powerful for a jury to decide whether to believe that complainant on this occasion than some relatively minor bias relationship that we are going to permit the defendant to explore. So again, I think it underscores the idea that that the categorical, the label of what kind of impeachment this is really shouldn't be driving the court's analysis. And if what that means is that there's a little bit more uncertainty, then I think that that's uh, an acceptable cost under the circumstances. Again, notice that rape shield is entering into a sphere that where it was in some sense entirely superfluous because we already have 404, which prohibits the use of any other act to show that trait, whatever that trait was in the bad old days, promiscuity or willingness to consent. We already had a tool to keep that stuff from happening. And I understand why that the need, perceived need to have it stated more clearly and more preemptively drove the rape shield rule and also in the larger context of a broad transformation of the culture in terms of sexuality, female sexuality, all the stuff that that we do when we teach a substantive law of sexual assault, that the evidentiary rule was part of that transformation. But I think now we're 25 years out or more and we can say, wait a second, have we struck the balance appropriately or have we really defined it so um, grudgingly that it's distorting what juries are permitted to hear and really without any sound analytic basis for it. So that raises an interesting question, which is, in many ways, Rape Shield was passed because of a seeming distrust of legal actors who may have been old-fashioned or traditional in their thinking at the time. You pass this law to change the culture Has the culture changed enough where we could potentially remove rape shield and go back to a more forceful application of the 404 rules to protect victims? That's a very interesting question. And how will we know until we pull the rug out? I mean, I I can't see that happening as a sort of practical political matter because it would seem like taking away something that's now part of the set of norms that we associate with trying these cases. But I think anecdotally, by my own perception, we're probably still in a place of transition. That is to say, I think it's generational sense of what happens in, I hate to use the, he said, she said, but that's the phrase we often use in these encounters. I think that there's a little bit of a generation gap still in terms of what people are bringing to the room when they hear about a sexual encounter between people who are known to each other who are not strangers. So I'm not sure that we're quite ready to say we don't need the rape shield rule at all. When I teach this, I do talk about the idea that the rule doesn't cover only other sexual conduct, that is other actual sexual experiences, but it it touches also on things like dress and behavior and use of contraception and uh, sexually transmitted infections, etc. All the things that would kind of, and do I think, continue to push buttons in terms of the way people understand sexuality and that kind of conduct. People are bringing their own experiences and their own morality and traditions to the table there. And I think that it is important that a lot of that noise be kept out of a sexual assault trial. So I think the rape shield rule does still need to be there to clear away all those kinds of bits of information that would be distorting But nevertheless, I think we can imagine, and I try in the paper to articulate some of the scenarios in which it is important to an accused for a legitimate reason to let the jury understand that there is some backstory here and that that backstory touches on sexual conduct should not be enough of a reason to keep it out of the courtroom. The primary path that you've proposed is to have the Supreme Court and and I guess the other federal courts, to expand the constitutional exceptions to 412. Another path is 
to have the advisory committee propose additional exceptions to the rape shield rule. Is that a possibility for you, or do you think that's not a tenable solution? Well, I think it is a possibility, but I think it would be difficult given the already structural problem. That is, if they're going to try to anticipate even more particular instances in which it should be permitted, I think they're going to hit up against the same problem that they don't have that crystal ball. And a more effective solution would be to try to construct 412 so that it looks more like the so-called French rules of 404, 407, et cetera where we'll articulate what's prohibited. This is what cannot be done. This inference should not be invited. And then the rest of it is the way we do it under 404, 407. We'll leave it to advocates to present a theory that's not the prohibited theory. And then that would be evaluated under 403. And I think that's where we get what you mentioned earlier, which is this return to a a standards approach, a discretionary approach, but within a very well-defined framework. 403 is very familiar to all litigants and trial judges, and you have to demonstrate that probative theory and that we're not running the risk of it really being substantially outweighed by the prohibited use. And I think that would be a much more effective way of dealing with the problem. Interestingly, the paper talks about this hierarchy of impeachment in the scope of 412, but obviously it goes beyond to all criminal cases. That is, I was carving it out for purposes of having this discrete set of examples within the world of sexual assault. How is it that impeachment through character might be more probative or more powerful than impeachment through bias? But Obviously, if and when the Supreme Court is ready to think about this problem, it's going to affect criminal cases in general. That is to say, beyond rape shield and beyond sexual assault cases, it's not entirely clear why a defendant in any case is much more constrained when the theory is contradiction or the theory is character than when the theory is bias. That leads us to the final question that I often ask, which is what's next? And Your last answer suggests that maybe there's an article in the works about our preference for bias-type evidence and whether or not that's a good thing writ large, not just in the rape shield context. Yeah, and that that is what needs to be done. I'm not writing it right now, but I should be. But it's absolutely parallel, and it subsumes this problem entirely. And I think we need to figure out what would be the best scenario in which to pose that question to the court and really push them on this idea that general attacks on credibility are not the same as uh, exploitation of bias. I just think that language really falls apart in your hands when you look closely at it. And what we really need is some tool that assesses the quantum significantly different impression of the witness's credibility or reasonable probability that this would affect the jury's determination of guilt or innocence. Those kinds of measuring tools, I think, would be much more appropriate across the board in the world of impeachment. So that's what I should be doing next. (laughs) Don't tell my dean. Well, Rosanna, thanks for taking the time to talk about this really interesting wrinkle in the rape shield law and how it squares with the right to present a defense. Great having you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. On the one hand, Rosanna certainly makes a compelling case. There are extreme cases in which you would think the defendant should be able to present evidence of the victim's past sexual conduct because it's critical to the defense's case. But on the other hand, as the old adage goes, Hard cases make bad law. Remember why rape shield exists in the first place. The worry is that without a bright line rule, legal actors will take insufficient account of victim interests when making evidentiary rulings. And as a corollary, we worry whether victims will be willing to come forward at all in such an uncertain and unwelcoming environment. And as I argued in the interview, in evidence law, we sometimes face harsh results because, well, rules are over and under-inclusive. And we are frequently willing to pay this price for the certainty and administrability that rules provide us. Maybe at the end of the day, I agree halfway with Rosanna. For sure, there's no particular reason to preference bias over other forms of impeachment. That seems to be just a matter of historical accident. So maybe the advisory committee should consider expanding the exceptions. At the same time, 
I remain concerned enough about protecting victims that I'm unwilling to move to a simple case-by-case -case balancing test. Perhaps the solution is something like the reverse 404 test that we see in the civil rape shield context, in which rape shield type evidence would be admissible only if the probative value substantially outweighed the unfair prejudice, both for the prosecution and for the victim. Even if we as a society have not changed enough culturally to remove rape shield entirely and return to the standard propensity rule, perhaps we have changed enough to justify moving to reverse 404. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, the University of Arkansas School of Law, as well as the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join me again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.